right. Um, good morning, everyone. It's time for the class to begin. So in today's class, we're going to introduce something that is called the Kirchhoff's Rule. Basically, we're going to use this for, let me just write this down here. So we're going to use this for something that we call spike complex. And let me explain what I mean by a complex circuit. So a complex circuit is going to have, uh, so this will have more than two power supply. So this is a very good example here. You can see that in this example, I have, um, so I have a body here. I also have a body right there. So there are two bodies in this circuit. So if you want to solve this type of problem, so, so basically, so we need to solve this. So think about, so we want to solve this to get the current. So example, solve. So for the current I1, I2, and I3. So when you have something like this, it's not easy to just, um, if you remember in the previous class, we said that if you have a simple circuit, you can just break it into series and parallel, and then you can combine those together to form the equivalent resistance. Then if you know what the equivalent resistance is, you can calculate the current and stuff like that. You cannot do that right here because, um, so the first thing is that you're going to notice that the current is branching a lot. And so, so we'll say that if you look at a point, so a point like this point here, so this is called a junction. So this is called a junction because uh, any current coming in like this is going to break up into two parts. One part is going to go down, one part moves in this direction. So basically we're going to be applying this. So we're going to have something like this um, junction. Plus. Now, uh, let me take a second. I want to take a second to, to explain these two concepts here. Because I think once we understand those two, two concepts, so let me share my other screen here. So suppose that we have a circuit that looks like this. So this is plus and this is minus, and this is minus. And let's assume that this is connected like this. Then I have the second power supply right there. So for example, call this the, the V1, call this the, the V2. Resistor in there, and then we'll add one resistor in here as well. So we have a resistor here, all this R1, and have a resistor here, all this R2, all 
Let's all be able to start here. So this would be a typical example of a complex circuit. So we have two power supplies, delta V1 and delta V2. And so I'm going to go ahead and put the current. So let's assume that there is a current here. So we're going to say that there's a current here. Let's call this current I1. Now, this current I1 is going to go through R1. And then once it gets to this point here, this point, the current is going to split up into two parts. One part is going to go here, we'll call this I2. And then one part goes like that, we'll call that I3. So notice what, what comes in that this is I1. So I1 goes into this point. Now, I'm also going to go ahead and put some numbers here. So let's call this point A, call this point B, call this point C, call this point D, call this point E, and then call this point F. So in this circuit, the point C and point D, these are called jun junctions. So point C and point D are called junctions. And let me explain why this is called a junction. This is called a junction because um, if you look at point C, so at point C, notice that I1, goes in, and then I2 and I3 goes out. And you're going to see that for this to happen, I1 must be equal to I2 plus I3. Does that make sense? The total current going into a junction must be equal to the total current coming out of a junction. So that's why this is very important. Now, let's look at point, so this was point C. We can do exactly the same for point D. Let's see what is happening here for point D. So I3, so I3 is going to continue to flow. So I3 is going to continue like this. So this is the same I3. This is the same I3. And this is the same I2 that goes in here. Now, you see that at point D, I2 is coming in, I3 is also coming in. They're going to add up together to create the same I1. So also at point D, I could also say that I2 comes in, I3 comes in, I1 goes up, which again is the same as that equation right there. So the key point is point C and point D are called junctions. Now, the point, so B, so for example, A, B, C, and D, this is called A, B, C, D, A. What is that the start point is equal to the end point? This is called a loop. And in this case here, my loop is going in the, this is a counterclockwise, I'm sorry, this is a clockwise loop. So I'm going in the clockwise direction. So that's one loop. I could also say that the point, for example, C, C, E, F, D, e, and C. Again, notice that the start point is supposed to the end point. This is supposed to be loop. Now, if you have something like this to solve, 
you can use whatever loop that you want to use. So for example, a loop could also be A, B, C, E, F, B and E. It's also a loop. So you can create whatever loop that you want to create as long as you know exactly what you're doing. All right, Ben. Uh, so we're going to see that. So the two rules, these two rules are called the Hecker's rules. So those are the rules that we're going to solve, need to solve all problems. The first one says that whenever you have a junction, the sum of the current going into a junction must be equal to the sum of the current coming out of the junction. So the first rule is a rule for current. So current going into a junction is equal to current coming out of a junction. Then the second rule is for a loop. So for a loop, it says that the change in the voltage in a loop must be equal to zero. So for example, if I were to calculate the total voltage in this loop here, it should be zero and the total voltage in this loop as well must be equal to zero. 